Hello and welcome to Man Enough. I'm Justin Baldoni. I'm Liz Plank. I'm Jamie Heath. Hi, Jamie Heath. <laughs> my it's voice is low. Hi, it's getting it, it, lower and it, lower. It, it, I got a frog in my throat when I said it. <laughs> Hi. Uh, your voice is very sexy. Um, <laughs> speaking of sexy, you know what's really sexy? Mm -hmm. Being an intellectual. Yes. I yes. think that's really sexy. Totally. Uh, and we have an intellectual on the show today, don't a we? A public intellectual. A public actually. intellectual, yeah. which that's, I think is really, really cool. Yeah. That's a really cool term. Mm -hmm. uh, Charity Croft is on the show. Mm. And uh, just for some backstory, if you don't know who Charity is, he is a uh, online YouTube digital creator, influencer, um, focused heavily on learning and, um, and helping people unpack and learn things that maybe they haven't thought of before. And I started watching his videos a while ago and he has this brilliant way of making um, very complex things seem digestible in like mm. five minutes or less, Yeah, um, which would have been really helpful for me when I was in high school. <laughs> I'll just be honest. Uh, I mean, he, I, if you, if you haven't um, heard of him, go watch, mm -hmm. go watch his videos. Even the concept of time, the universe, and God in five minutes or less. Good luck with that. Yeah, I'm um, excited. And he does it. So um, we're going to get into a lot of stuff. I think I saw Liz's note. She's got lots, lots. of questions about very interesting things. Yes. You're so good at that. About. I'm so bad at that. I, <laughs> Never. That's how my brain works. <laughs> I, uh, my prepared. brain does not for some reason. That's like and, uh, and not to like notes. not to put this in the binary, but we do know that women tend to come more prepared than men. Mm -hmm. um, Facts. But that's just you and me. It's okay. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Jamie. I'm so confused by that statement. You are? Yeah. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> it's just interesting. Some things are true to acknowledge and say women are better at taking pre being prepared than this, than men. Then we say it in another way, and it's... It's because they've it's, had to. Well, well, it's, yeah, because, we've been, it's just because we've, they've had to. Yeah. If women aren't prepared generally, yeah. and, and also you know this, it's the I same know thing this. with black folks. Right? Oh, yeah. It sucks that I have to be prepared in a way that you don't have to. Yes. But... Because I've been have to, I'm better at it. <laughs> yes. I mean, is that... Well, wait, let, you know what? Let's, <laughs> like, let's save this for the outro. People don't know about the drama, let's, so they're let's confused. Save, let's save this for the outro. Because right now, we're, we're going to go right into charity. <laughs> people watch you're like, what just happened? It's like, you'll when see you go, when you watch the episode, it's you'll like see. Because we're go doing to this. It's someone's we're... house, and they're, you clearly know they're fighting, like, do you want some donuts? Yes. <laughs> Jerry, we're doing why don't this you get the donuts after we've already had the uh, the, the, the conversation? <laughs> so the conversation itself with Charity. Don't uh, skip the yeah. the conversation with Charity. <laughs> However, if you are really curious, go to the outro. <laughs> uh, we'll be right back with Charity Croft. He's amazing. You don't want to miss this. This <laughs> is man enough. Yes, indeed. <laughs> This episode is brought to you by Ladder. Hey everyone, it's Jamie Heath from the Man Enough Podcast. Check this out. I just bought a house recently and I am so blessed to tell you that I got a pool. What? Who has a pool nowadays? But my kids, six and four years old, are splashing, doing all the things, getting underwater and diving and doing all these things that just make my heart sore. And you know, I realized that life happens to you fast. And every day I get to spend with my family is a gift when so many things remain unpredictable in this world. Like so many others, we're all doing our best to navigate our circumstances and hold on to the special moments spent with the ones we love. And life insurance gives me a lot of peace of mind knowing that my family will be taken care of. So why not pay a bit each month to protect the ones you love? If you're asking yourself this question, choose Ladder. Ladder is a 100% digital, no doctors, no needles, no paperwork, when you apply for $3 million in coverage or less. Just answer a few questions about your health in an application. You just need a few moments and a phone or laptop to apply. Ladder's smart algorithms work in real time, so you'll find out if you're instantly approved. There's no hidden fees. You can cancel any time. Get a full refund if you change your mind in the first 30 days. Ladder policies are issued by insurers with long, proven histories of paying claims. They're rated A and A plus by AM Best. And Ladder's customers rate them 4.8 out of 5 stars on Trustpilot. And they made Forbes Best Life Insurance 2021 list. Finally, since life insurance costs more as you age, now's the time to cross it off your list. So go to ladderlife.com slash mad enough today to see if you're instantly approved. That's L-A-D-D-E-R life.com slash mad enough. Ladderlife.com slash mad enough.
Hello and welcome back to Man Enough. We have a very, very cool person with us today. Mm. Not just cool, but like intellectually mm -hmm. cool. If that's that even a thing, but I think it is a thing because cool in all the ways. Charity Croft, my man. What's happening? What's up, yes, brother? Being intellectually cool, that's my whole shtick. Like is to make me intellectual cool for sure. I started uh, I started following Charity mm -hmm. uh, a while back and his videos, your videos, man, they just they I just love them so much. You have these you have such a unique way of distilling these complex thoughts mm. in five minutes and in 30 seconds. And I just, it just always leaves me thinking and wanting more. And uh, I'm just so happy that uh, you wanted to come on and play with us today. Mm. Really appreciate it. Yeah. yeah. So let's give our audience a taste of who you are. Uh, you're one of the most eclectic influencers on social media. You are Instagram's coolest public intellectual, which I'm going to want you to define because I think it's one of the, we were all talking about how it was one of the coolest terms we've probably ever heard. <laughs> um, Charity, you are a rapper, a producer, a designer, and the quintessential millennial creative <laughs> with over 200 million views on your videos, uh, which you make all at home, right? This is all, you're a one man band. Yeah. Um, your work yeah. embraces a limitless lifestyle of love, empathy, and creativity, which makes you a perfect, just perfect guest for us to talk to. Yes. Mm. Welcome to the show, man. I Welcome, appreciate bro. You. Slight flex, though. Uh, that's like 300 million views now. That's okay. all. Oh, God. yeah. No, no. Hey. Hey. Updating the bio. <laughs> oh, God. Slight flex. We will fix that in post. Who missed 100 million views uh, in the studio? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I'm saying that's all. That was my bad. No, no, no. I'm, I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> 300 that. million. And by the time this comes out, it'll be 400. Yeah. Million. Well, okay, we're going to start with uh, the question we ask everybody, mm. all right? And mm -hmm. uh, that question is, Charity, when was the last time that you didn't feel enough? <laughs> Nigga, today? <laughs> today? I just had, like, a huge, like, situation at the bank. Uh, I don't know how much into astrology you are, but Mercury retrograde is retrograde. Yep, it and, um, <laughs> and, 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 and interestingly enough, uh, Mercury retrograde is usually amazingly pleasant for me. This is the first time I've actually felt it. But yeah, uh, as of the last few days, I've been going through a lot of um, relationship issues, not even romantic relationships, like friends and loved ones and uh just kind of debating within myself, am I, am I the issue here? Are they the issue? Is anyone the issue? Learning to gain empathy for other people going through their stuff, even when it kind of adversely affects you emotionally. Mm. And so, yeah, I felt not enough for the past five days, at least, for sure. Mm. So I, I thought Merc yeah. Mercury and retrograde only affected electronics. Oh, does no. it? Does it also? Is it, so Mercury is the planet that rules communication. So the reason why it specifically affects electronics is because electronics are source are are vessels through which we communicate. But ah. but far before there were electronics existing, Mercury would retrograde. It would, it just would be like you know a conversation that isn't the most um, fluent isn't the most All clear right. and so a lot mm. of blur but again we don't got to get into a big astrological i, I love hearing here, a man talk yeah. about astrology because women always yeah. get told you know oh you talk about astrology this thing you invented and it's like well, we talk about the <laughs> stock market all the time and that's a thing we invented um, <laughs> you know it's so, so I funny a woman it. just said that to me <laughs> <laughs> oh you're a man that like a that likes astrology like apparently it's a woman-centric thing historically i didn't know that until like literally this week well it's a way to kind of the, the way that we even i in had internalized the 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 way we dismiss astrology like i used to be that person and i didn't realize that mm -hmm. we actually just like other things that women enjoy or like we dismiss them because women like them right mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. women um you know again it's uh, my astrologer astrologist uh is a queer man so it's not even a woman but it's still a space yeah. that's primarily um occupied in, yeah by women so it's it's yeah. I, I'd love to hear I, I men talk about it. I believe it. in it because I can tell you right now when Mercury's in retrograde, nothing works for my wife. Mm. She, she's just like, <laughs> and, and she's already got this this very powerful energy where she electronics does. will just not work with her. Like she'll have to, <laughs> she will step yeah. away from things and then things will start working. And I'll be like, babe, it was working. And she gets so frustrated 
And I'm like, no, 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 yeah. sweetheart, just press this. And then she walks up and I watch it break. This has happened over and over again. But when Mercury's in retrograde, stay away from Emily. Oh, <laughs> if, no. you, if, you've, if, if you value your, if you value those things. <laughs> stay away. Um, well, hey, I got a question for you. Yeah. So I read that you, uh, I think you had two stints of school, right? You went to school and then you failed out. And um, then maybe you went back or something. Three times. Okay, tell me about that. Yeah, I went to school, got kicked out, went to school again, got kicked out, and then went to school, and uh, that one worked. <laughs> you mind sharing? What, what what was that about? Well, so the year I graduated high school, I was, like, in the bottom, literally, like, 10 people in my class GPA-wise. Like, I had, like, a 1.9 or some terrible shit. Wow. And um, But I had, like, one of the highest SAT scores in my entire city. And um, what that and, and it was interesting because I remember like all the teachers was like, like I, I got called to the principal principal's office when SAT scores came out because they assumed I cheated mm -hmm. because there was no empirical evidence that that I was ever an intellectual person. I was I literally have a trophy for class clown of high school. Right. So I'm just the wild, crazy person. No one ever imagined that I was a person that had any type of potential, you know, mm -hmm intellectual capacity. But to ask your question more specifically, Jamie, the way in which school is set up, it is primarily a place in which we are taught obedience. Yes. Again, like school was created. I did a, a video recently about this. School was created by a guy named Horace Mann, the concept that we have now of, of current the current educational system. And it was created during the Industrial Revolution. So school was literally created for the only sole purpose of getting you to be able to be good at a labor job, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so me being the very, very anti-authoritarian person that I am, like nobody can nobody can tell me what to do ever. Mm -hmm. I've gotten fired from every job I've ever had. You know, I'm just like, I am inherently disobedient, if you will. <laughs> and so structures <laughs> that require uh, do this in this set order because you are told by some person above you that this is what you must do. Mm -hmm. I don't fit in them well at all. Mm -hmm. And we know that, uh, you know, it's very it's a very different experience for a black m boy or man in the educational system than it is for a white boy or man or a white girl, right? That you're for, far more likely to be disciplined, to yeah. be suspended, to be kicked out. Um, mm -hmm. So you're for treated sure. very differently, um, even with the same kind of disobedience that that perhaps white boys were showing in, in, in the same respect. Granted, I didn't get kicked out of school for disobedience. I got academically dismissed because mm -hmm. I didn't do any work. So it wasn't justified. <laughs> that was me. Out. I was I was trash like i was trash <laughs> but, but did you not do, do the work all, you didn't do the work but you knew the answer so like you would ace your test but you didn't do any homework is that kind of what it was exactly like that that is exactly the case because again okay i understand what we're doing here i i actually even enjoy what we're speaking about but what i don't enjoy in general in life and this is something that i actually need to work on back to astrology we're not going to get too far over there but there is an astrological undertone of what I'm about to say. There is a useful necessity for, for being able to do things that you don't enjoy doing, right? Mm -hmm. Discipline, daily tedium is a thing that I just have an issue with. And so even though I kind of wear it as a badge of honor in hindsight, the reality is that I should have been more disciplined. It would have benefited me to have some level of, of an ability to do things that are instructed to me mm. and to follow through. Because again, consistency, discipline, these masculine traits are the positive directions of masculinity. I have Nipsey Hussle behind me and his, and his whole thing was like that type of masculinity, being a leader, being a, a disciplined person. All of those things are good aspects of masculinity. But because I was so anti any structure at all, I just wouldn't do anything that that, that was in line with that at all. But mm. in hindsight, it would have benefited me to have the discipline to um, push it through, because even in my life as a public figure, um, sometimes you got to do shit that you don't feel like doing. And yeah. oftentimes I just won't do it. And that's kind of silly. Even things I enjoy. I appreciate mm. you recognizing that. Right? Yeah, because it'd be very easy for you to be like, oh, like this, this all sucks and you shouldn't have to do anything and this is all backwards. But but you're saying, no, 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 no. There are some there are some parts of this that don't serve me. And absolutely. I appreciate you being willing to take account. Absolutely. I agree with you completely, man. For me, the school system, I, I just did not fit at all. 
Mm. And, um, and I really struggled because I did not learn the way that teachers were teaching me. And even as a test taker, that just wasn't for me. I'm, I was a kinesthetic learner. I needed to create, I needed to move, I needed to make movies instead of book reports. And finally I had one teacher, and I write about this in my book, Man Enough. I had one teacher, my senior year was the first teacher that actually I feel like ever saw me. And I don't think I would be here if it wasn't for her. She allowed me to, instead of reading The Great Gatsby and uh, doing, or instead of writing a book report on The Great Gatsby, she allowed me to make an alternate ending as a movie. And it was mm. the first little movie I made. Mm. And that was when I realized, like, this is what I'm supposed to do. And then it was different. I could read the book. Because then I was thinking about how I wanted it to end. And it was, and here I am now. And it was all because a teacher allowed me to think differently because my intelligences were not the way that the school system was teaching me. And mm. she saw me. That's fire. Did you ever have a teacher like that? Well, so luckily, it's, it's interesting that you bring that up. That was a very good uh, segue. Um, I went, so my high school that I went to, the one blessing of it is that it was a performing arts high school. Oh, and yeah. so I was a piano major. You see what I'm saying? So, so every year from sixth to 12th grade, it was, it was middle school and high school put together. I played the piano every day. I have to go to piano class. And my teacher, Miss Neville was, uh, a wonderful, wonderful woman. Ironically, very, Mm-hmm. David, yeah. you're not practicing. You know, she was very like that. But uh, my, my birth name is David, by the way. Charity is a stage name. But obviously the, the the normal people that you play in classical repertoire, Beethoven, Brahms, Mozart, all of that shit. Again, that would require me to look at this sheet music, learn it, practice it, stuff I don't feel like doing. So what she would do is so that I could still play in the um, symphony, uh, it was called Indiana State Symphony Music Association. It was basically like where you would go to do all your recitals at. So that I could still play, she would always give me improvisational jazz pieces. And basically those pieces were like, mm. um, they were like, there was a basic structure that you must follow. So basically it gave you like a key and a tempo and uh, the bass notes that you must play, but the right hand you could just improv, you just you can just improvise, mm-hmm. and so that gave me the ability to to me- to meld the more free form me into this structured thing called classical repertoire. So yeah, I had my uh, piano teacher, Miss Neville. Well, thank God for teachers. Thank <laughs> yeah. God for her uh, yeah. because she clearly uh, allowed you to 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 flourish as an artist and as a musician. And, and you've used your music so much to talk about a lot of the topics that we discuss on this podcast and that Justin talks about in his book. You have this incredible lyric where you say, when you tell a boy to man up and swallow his emotions, when you tell a man to man up and spit out his empathy, you aren't building a brother. You are inciting a psychopath. So I'm wondering if you can speak to those lyrics. I, I it really spoke to me um, as as a person who who cares deeply about men, and and yeah, sort of what what led you um, to to write those words. Yeah, way before you know intersectional feminism, and I knew about any of that shit. Again, I am a black man from Gary, Indiana, the hood. You dig what I'm saying? And so there is a certain necessity even or an expectation for masculinity specifically the type of masculinity that is regarded as toxic masculinity is particularly rampant in the black community specifically because and again there there are so that's why i love intersectional uh work because there are intersections so yes toxic masculinity might be more heightened in the black community but also via our facing systemic oppression and our necessity to survive that is much more particular in the black community a certain like i'm not about to back down from shit is kind of necessary when you're trying to survive and then especially when you're in a place that you don't got no money you don't uh there are few resources and few resources cause people to fight rob steal in order to gain resources so it's just like if you can't fight, somebody might just rob you and take your shit. You dig what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So there's almost a necessity for a certain level of masculinity. But anyway, I, I kind of went on the tangent. But to come back to, to where I, I was going originally, uh, there are two women, amazing women, I won't say their name for the sake of their privacy, that uh, essentially told me that I wasn't shit. You know, back when I was like 18. They, they, and they literally just said like that. They're like, Charity, you're so sweet. And you're so loving at heart, but you're really a piece of shit, you know? And I'm like, what? You know? And again, so I was raised by a Christian father. There's also a huge uh, 
correlations between Christianity and patriarchy. Uh, I was I was raised by a deeply Christian father who my friend, one of the women who kind of introduced me to feminism, basically, um, she told me that my father is what's known as a benevolent sexist. Mm. And I thought that was the most interesting We love that term. word. Mm-hmm. Liz introduced us to that word. Yeah. Mm. Oh, really? Can really? you define okay, it so for people who may not know what that means? My daddy is so fucking sweet and kind. It don't make no sense how kind my daddy is. And he's particularly kind to women. Mm. And so women love my daddy. But the only reason why he's so kind to them is because he just kind of inherently views them as less than. Mm. So, oh, sweetie. So, oh, no, anything you need, sweetie. And so, like, my sister is a super daddy's girl. My sister don't know how to do shit. She doesn't know how to do anything (laughs) because she was never allowed to do anything. And my daddy would do it all for her. Wow, You dig what I'm saying? But Mm -hmm. for me, because he's raising a man, and he used to always say to me, I'm raising... Uh, you to be a cover and your sister to be covered is how he would. Uh, and wow. so basically he said, I am your sister's cover until she finds a husband, but you must be a cover now for your family. And, and again, this is benevolent, right? Yeah. This is seemingly with the desire to protect women. My daddy would never hurt a woman, but I, but if you was just to sit and listen to him talk about women, it's very like subsidiary. It's very like, in addition to addendum, oh, yeah, let's make sure that you know how those women be. And so I kind of adap- adapted that when I was younger. And so I was always really nice to women. But again, because of kind of this this understanding that they are less than and must be babied, therefore. Mm-hmm. And um, women kind of just called me out on that and they just said, yeah, no, that's like, why do you think that? Why do you treat me like this? Why do you consistently over talk me? Why do you not value when I'm speaking? And stuff like that. So to to take it all the way back to the initial question about what you read, um, what we expect of men is to be strong, to be um, to to take the world. We teach men to take. To, to we we imagine that masculinity is is mm-hmm. is this pushing through at all costs. And the concept of pushing through at all costs isn't even a horrible concept, but it is horrible when it is void of the necessary empathy for other people. Yeah. And mm-hmm. thus, without empathy, we're not, again, I don't remember exactly how I said it, but you're not building someone up. You're just de- you're just deleting empathy, mm-hmm. which is like creating a psychopath. We're not making you stronger. We're just telling you to not care about others for your own sake. Right. And how strong are you if you have to treat women like babies, <laughs> like to feel OK? Yeah. Right. Because, like, I think there's this idea that, um, yeah, I'm protecting you, but you're protecting yourself. Like you're actually mm. you want it's about you. It's not really about, yeah. you know, me. And I was talking to Esther Prell about this at a random one of the first parties I went to coming out of the pandemic. And Esther Prell was there. So I was like, I'm just going to talk to you the whole time, you know, and I sort of <laughs> talked to her about this idea of like men who want to save you, men who want to take care of you, like um Because I had a proclivity to go towards that in a certain way, not in the overt way, but in the covert way. And she was like, well, you have to realize that men who want to take care of you, you will end up taking care of them. And that was like Mm. shifted, like, you know, those click moments. You're like, oh, I'm it's this has shifted my entire perspective. So, yeah, I'm curious, like, Mm. what does it mean to be a strong? What like what does it mean? What does the definition of strength even mean if it is if it requires seeing other people as lesser? Like, how strong are you if that's what you need yeah, to that, feel strong? That is not strength. So I would not say that strength is predicated upon you treating others as though they are lesser. And also, um, as I've learned, see, see, because there's it's so interesting because of the fact that I was always so uh, feminine in my energy. And what I mean by that, I'm speaking to like, I'm speaking like yin yang. So what I mean is like, I am a creative. I am an artist. I like pretty words and cool clothes. I like beautiful things. I like creation, which are things that we would call feminine, or at least in the Taoist worldview, you would call that uh, yin energy. You dig what I'm saying? Which is all of these things that are that are feminine. There is still a value to yang energy, and there is a yang energy, i.e. masculinity, that does not require oppression or subjugation. Mm -hmm. That would be leadership. Mm -hmm. That would be 
being able to be decisive. Yeah. That would be a uh, well-planned and organized and conscientious. So there are valuable aspects of what we quintessentially consider masculinity. We, we conflate the two. We imagine that to lead is to dominate. Mm-hmm. You see yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. And it's not. And there, and there it is. Yeah. Hmm. Jamie, you've been very quiet. Yeah, you know, sometimes you just have to listen. Um. You know, there's been things that I've wanted to, to interject and say, but um, I'm just, uh, number one, enchanted with you, you know, who you are and what you're talking about. You're super, super amazing. I love the fact that you are even thinking about these things, that you're reflecting on how you could have been better, you know, when you were a kid and maybe like, you know, been a little bit more willing to accept some structure rather than just simply rebelling against that Um what you're talking about now, these concepts are really wonderful. So you deserve all the credit and props and recognition for the man that you are. And yet you're also not unique. And what I say by that is that there are a lot of other black men that are brilliant just as you are. Um, Mm. And, but oftentimes what we do is we hear someone talk like you, super articulate, super wonderful, great concepts. And then we make you a token and then assume that all the other black people are not as capable. And, Mm. uh, so what, because obviously you say you grew up in the hood and you got a lot of brothers and friends and, and cousins and, you know, family that, that are also come from the hood that I know are uh, capable, as capable as you, but maybe didn't have the opportunity to reflect, maybe weren't had, didn't have parents that supported them to spread their wings or such, right? Um, yes. Tell me what you think about that. What has allowed you to be the man that you are that you think maybe others didn't, weren't given the opportunity to become? So you just speaking. You can't see, but I'm I'm a nigga that when I get excited, like my eyes well up. I almost never cry patriarchy, right? I was kind of taught not to cry, so I don't cry. But when I get excited, my eyes like tear up. What you just said made me tear up because that's my life. And what I mean by that is like whenever I'm out in public and people look at me as this, this intellectual, you know, whatever the fuck, I get extra nigga-like on purpose. You dig what I'm saying? Because I need you to see I need you to see that I am no different, that I am not, I am not, not Trayvon Martin. I talk, I tell, I tell people about the Trayvon Martin case and the the deep metaphorical implications in that. It's like George Zimmerman killed Trayvon Martin because he looks and appears and seems like what he would consider a less than human being, or if George Zimmerman even considered Trayvon a human being, right? And so thus this threat, this spider, this this thing that must be exterminated is, I shall kill it, is what George Zimmerman said when he looked at, at, at Trayvon. He did not see his humanity, mm. right? And on when you broaden that out, we as, we as Black people specifically, like you said, when people see somebody like me, they almost separate me mm. And they say, well, why can't Trayvon be more like you? That's right. You dig what I'm saying? And sometimes we do that even amongst the Black community, right? Mm -hmm. They vaunt up somebody like me and say, oh, your cousin, he he ain't shit. Why can't you be like Charity? And it's just like, no. Mm -hmm. Again, I am an anomaly that just so happened to me. So I make sure that when I'm in public spaces, spaces, specifically those with white people, I don't assimilate into what they would imagine I should be. I I showcase to them very, very overtly that I am still from Gary, Indiana. I'm still what you may have thought five years ago was a nigga until you saw me. But then when you see that, oh, there is this ability. So there's this book. So we've all heard of the term code switching, right? That is something mm-hmm. that Black people tend to do almost as a survival mechanism within white spaces. They they adapt and assimilate to that because they feel like what they are is inherently less than. It's, it's, this, it's called internalized oppression. We imagine that we are not as good as you. So when a white person walks in the room, we all sit up better and say, oh, well, absolutely, sir. Um, in fact, I think, and it's just like, no. Nah. Mm-hmm. I, I read a, a book that talks about code meshing, which is the one of the most beautiful concepts ever. It's essentially to like, yes, you need to be understandable and and, and communication is about, is about people's ability to understand you. So you must be articulate and eloquent, but I also must show and invite people into this world that they thought was foreign mm-hmm. to, to show them that I am not 
this this distant, separate thing from what Trayvon Martin is or what the hood is. So to answer your question, Jamie, I make it my business to showcase that duality, my fullness, and not be seen as this um, this separate entity to look up towards, but rather that all Black people uh, have within them a beauty that should be respected in and of itself, not because it's smart and it looks good for what I like to see Black people look like. Mm. So, yeah. mm. I appreciate you saying that. Yeah, I have a lot of the same experience, but only when I was a kid, um, Cause I was, I was one of these brilliant kids, right? I was super smart, and yeah. I was. Um, I'm also a musician, you know. That's my whole life, um, and uh, went to school for music yeah. and blah 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 and all he that. He was he was producing like Grammy records at like 16 years. Yeah, old. all 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 that stuff. Go crazy! And, we gotta talk. I'm gonna come to LA song right. <laughs> and my mom is white, right? So I got a whole yeah. side of family that's white. Beautiful, wonderful, incredible, beautiful people. But what they would say yeah. sometimes is. Uh, well, Jamie, you're not really black. You know, you're you're just my cousin, or you're you're my niece, or mm. all this. And I didn't really internalize what that meant till later. I got to be about 16, 17 years old, and I was like, "Wait a minute, you saying I'm not black? Why? Because I'm articulate, because I'm smart, mm. because you don't see exactly. me as you see all the black people. So therefore, in your mind, I'm not really black because everybody else in the world sees me as black. I walk through the world, I experience all the same shit, right? But you don't see me as black because you don't see me like these others." Now, these exactly. are good, wonderful people that had good hearts, but still all this, you know, they still carry racism and all this stuff. Racism so, is, is an inherent thing. That's right. Yeah. And then I started inter internalizing it. So I would see someone that looked like you. I'd be like, well, I'm not mm -hmm. him. I'm not him. See, they're, they're, they're others. Now, I'm like 10, 11 years exactly. old. I'd be in school with white folks. The blacks were over there. I needed everybody to know that I had a white mama because I was different. See, I was better. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So you start internalizing that. And then as a man, I started walking like that and then started finding that I needed. So when you speak to about how we stand up and start code switching when we around people, I still do that to mm. this day, right? Mm. I mean, I'm aware of it. Um, and I think we all code switch in some sense. So obviously we had, we talk a little bit different with our grandparents than we do with our babies and with our, you know and friends and all that stuff. We all find a way that we code switch a little bit. That's acceptable. But when you start doing it to camouflage who you really are so that someone else can accept you, and when you do mm. it because the world has told you that you are uh, not seen and valued for what you are, you know, then we got a problem. So um, I appreciate you Absolutely. talking about that because I, I certainly relate to that a lot. And then my, my, my follow-up question is then, so now as a man, and I see what you're doing, the work is just like the proof is in the pudding, what you're talking about. Why do you feel it's so important when you talk so eloquently about masculinity and some of the toxic stuff about it? Why do you feel this is so important for uh, other people to learn? It's interesting how, uh, how the two connect. Uh, white supremacy is patriarchy, and it took a and once and once that shit click, it's just like ah! like it's like you feel like you found the answer to all human suffering, damn near, you know. But it's just like, can you explain? The, well, yeah. Oh, sorry. I was. I thought you were going to go something, and I want you to explain that because I think a lot of people don't realize that. For mm -hmm. sure. How did white people take over the world? <laughs> they ain't hug their way to take it over the world. They didn't nurture <laughs> their way to take it over. You know what I'm saying? They shot motherfuckers up, right? It was masculinity. The world was taken over by white men. 90% of all murders are done by men. 90%. Mm -hmm. No, I th actually, I think it's like 95. It's, it's 90 to 95% of the time that anybody ever dies, a man was the killer. That's... Mm -hmm. That's bunkers. Like that's just that's a bunker statistic. Like so, when we think about white supremacy, how is white supremacy enacted through power, through domination, through force, through taking, through subjugation, through masculine concepts? Mm -hmm. And so I realized that the same thing. Because here's one thing that all black people can relate to. Not all black people, but a huge majority of black people can relate to the fact that there exists some type of oppression in America. So as a black man, you're like, oh shit. The same thing white people would be doing to me, I'd be doing to women. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It is just like, and that's a tough pill to swallow, especially as a black person, because when you're a black man, you you have the advantage to say that I did this video that everybody hates. I almost don't even post it no more because every time I get it, every black man just wants to like, they just hate me. Mm. And I don't, and I don't want to be looked at like that because I love black men, but also I... I love us enough to hold us to the fire when necessary. Mm. I got this video called, Are Straight Black Men the White People of Black People? 
niggas hate when I post that shit because it's just like no one would ever want to say that um, the things that 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 white people have done to to black people we are doing that to women. We're just like no, nah, that doesn't equate. And so the the normal talking points are we don't have any systems of power behind us and blah blah blah. And it's like no, like systemic oppression doesn't actually mean like a system. Like the way in which we rear black people or not just black people, but all men is systematically uh, creates a a very natural oppression. And, and most of it, because again, and the reason why people hate feeling like oppressors so much is because most people, most men and even most white people are not intentionally harming people. You dig what I'm saying? But when you exist in a place that was made for and by you mm. and you are this, thus having privileges as a result of that and you are not doing anything to to relinquish said privileges. In fact, you're not even aware that you have privileges. It just seems like what is normal. Then you existing in that normalcy, even though you mean no harm, is actually harmful to people. Mm-hmm. You not actively fighting against the normalized behavior of pseudo psychopathy that men have is inherently harmful, even if you're a nice guy. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, yeah, that's some shit. The whole world got to learn like now or we're going to die. Mm -hmm. Like, or it's like, or we die. Mm -hmm. And Cartoli has a book called A New Earth. And at the beginning of it, he says, we are in a very awkward predicament where our choice is evolve or die. And I believe that wholeheartedly. Mm-hmm. If we do not understand how to um, decolonize and dissociate white supremacy and patriarchy from our current way of existing, we will kill each other mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. we'll kill the world, which will still involve us all dying. So it's knowing like that, that we need mm. to 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 make some changes um, and be different because we can talk about all we want. Right. But nothing changes until we For actually sure. change. Tell me For something. Sure. You, you talk about. Um, I'm, I'm actually interested in moving on to like some of the ways and that we tangible ways and concrete ways and things that we do to actually undo this whole system. And I think it starts, mm-hmm. obviously we have to deal with it in a systemic, systemic way, but also like individually, you right. Could raising our babies yeah. and, and saving these babies the way that we talk to them and treat our boys and girls and stuff. So you talk about one of the things that's like taboo for men to talk about is depression. Um, weakness, yeah. things that, uh, or at least is perceived as weakness. And you are open about the fact that you have suffered with some depression. Um, so you don't necessarily have to get into all the reasons why. I don't mean that, but tell me why you feel it's uncomfortable, why it's why it's important to share that out loud and to share with other people. Uh, I want to uncouple a few things that exist in that question. Please. I am not the super mental health guy. You dig what I'm saying? Like, I'm not the one that's that's just like, yes, let's talk about depression all day. Uh, because to be frank, yes, let's talk about depression, but also what feels, what I have noticed is that oftentimes, <sighs> so I'm writing a whole book called Build and Destroy. And the reason why I'm, I'm going somewhere because it's just so much stuff just, it you know. It's the, all the, meshed together. Yeah, the, yeah. the uh, the super like activist space uh, term is like, let's unpack this. There's so much to unpack here. And so it's just like, I'm writing a book called Build and Destroy. And this is not a plug for my book. This is because this is relevant in this conversation. And so basically the overarching concept of the book, it's, it's an intersection between a self-help book and a societal critique. What that means is that there are books like Think and Grow Rich and Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, all of the self-help books that tell you, you can become whole, you can become a great person, you can find peace. And then there are like societal critique books, Pedagogy of the the Oppressed, Race Matters by Cornel West, talking about society and what's wrong with it. And so if I heal people, I can heal people all day. If you're still getting shot by the police, then it doesn't matter. Hmm. Right. And then at the same time, I could reconstruct the entire government system. If people on an individual level still feel hopeless, it doesn't matter. Yeah. So we need some type of intersectional book that speaks to the self and the society simultaneously. So to back to your question about speaking about depression, I don't speak about depression on some like we all need to talk about it because I am aware 
again, self-help me, is aware that consistently we, we, we begin to identify with our issues and almost make identities. I'm depressed. Mm-hmm. Me and my anxiety, I believe that we should do away with the concept of owning anxiety. People use Ryan like, well, you know, my anxiety and my depression. And then some, pers- some person in the mental health space would reply to me and say, well, no, these are things that people can live with. And rather than hating themselves for it, they just embrace it as a part of them so that there isn't this, this negative directed energy towards it. I do understand that. And also, and I think and also are the most important words that we need right now in this society because we're ultra polarized about yes, everything. If you I, don't feel firmly yes. about this, then you're against us. And that amen. I'm is. saying amen, amen, mm-hmm. amen. Yes, sir. You dig what I'm saying? So like, yes, do not hate yourself for having uh, for, for dealing with depression and anxiety. And so I get why people say my in order to own it and kind of make it a part of them. But also the negative potential repercussion of that is now that you have owned it, you almost feel like, who am I without anxiety? Yeah, that's you. And you can't and you, you. and you imagine that it is you. And it's just like, no, that is not you. You deal with it, but mm-hmm. you are bigger than that. So to bring back to your point about, it, yes, I talk about it, but notice I typically talk about it in this I don't talk about it as a part of me. I talk about it as a thing that I have dealt with and sometimes even currently deal with that I am progressively and ever moving beyond because it is not the normal, natural state to be depressed and anxious. That is not good. That is not something that we should claim as a part of who we are. Mm -hmm. No, we are bigger than that and are able to, to, to rise above it. So I speak about it more so from a storyteller standpoint, for the hero's journey, like, yes, that is an obstacle that so many people deal with. And I am very open about the fact that I deal with that same obstacle, but I am ever moving beyond it. I think it's mm-hmm. important. So, yeah, I think it's an important best. distinction, Charity. Good point. The, first of all, I mean, snapping, amens, hallelujahs, whatever we want to say right now, everything you just Real said, I, I, can't, said. I, I can't agree with you more. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Especially because when we think about mental health right now we're in this very strange place where we still got to remember that half the people don't know it exists like Mm. men it's not a thing mental health no no no. physical health is a thing Mm. mental health isn't even Mm. a thing yet because most of us men as you know don't even know that we're feeling anything because we like Mm. we bury it we bury bury it down so deep and you know as bell hook says we commit that soul murder we don't even know we have it we don't even know we have anxiety or depression i was one of those people for a large part of my life that I didn't even know I was having panic attacks until a year and a half ago when I was talking to my wow. therapist and uh, and you know she she asked me if I was having if I've ever ever had a panic attack and I said no and then later on in therapy I was like yeah sometimes I find it hard to breathe I can't take a full breath <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and then I'm like you know and then as we as we as we always do as men we're just like oh yeah it's fine I'll just push through it <laughs> And she's like, oh, no, no, no. How long has this been happening? I'm like, my whole life. <laughs> she's like, sweetheart, you've had panic attacks. I didn't even know it. Mm. As a man, I'm not allowed to feel it. Mm. But what you mm. said and what you've also talked about is that all of this comes from a place. Mm. It all comes from trauma. From childhood mm. trauma. You made a video about that. From you know trauma growing up in the hood. From trauma from our parents. Whatever that is. And these are all symptoms of a larger thing. And what we're doing now is we're trying to say, hey, we We have mental health issues. Hey, men, you have mental health issues, but we can't let that define who we are and also make that an excuse. Absolutely. Um, So there's this idea of like, great, how do we start to heal? Because healing is a, it's a verb, it's an action. We have to do it. It's not Mm -hmm. just like, yes, I have to accept, first of all, that I have a mental health issue, which for men is one of the hardest things to do because that is weak, right? Only women have those things, mm. right? We can't have those. Mm. Then when we when we accept it, we have to find a way to heal it because we don't want to just stay there. Right. Um, so I just I appreciate what you're doing, what you're saying. I cannot wait for that book. Mm. Uh, I think that's so important. And I know Liz has some amazing questions. And I want you to <laughs> <laughs> yes, she does. Well, I you talk about so many incredible things in your videos. Uh, it was really hard to 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 nail it down to a few questions, but I <laughs> so loved many. in your video, mate, you made about what's going on in Haiti and the border. Um, you called. Uh, 
you said that the American dream is a concept um, that was acquired by global theft. So you talk a lot yes. about global <laughs> politics, right? And, and it's something we haven't really done on this podcast. Like, I think when it comes to feminism and when it comes to gender equality, uh, it's incredibly important to talk about the global care chain, to talk about how this is not just an issue in America. It then extends and reproduces itself, um, patriarchy, white supremacy, if we don't actually acknowledge it. So I come back to, you know, Mariah um, Lasari, who talks about plantation feminism and that we don't want to reproduce yeah. racism in the way that we approach feminism. And so I think about that. It made me think about what does that look like for a men's movement, a, a mindful masculinity or whatever you want to call it, um, movement to also be in, not just intersectional, you know, in terms of identities nationally, but also internationally and it addressing, you know, you mentioned colonization and, and the importance of that, of, of decolonization. So yeah, like how do we I feel like this movement is not new, obviously, but we are starting to build it. And so how do we make sure that it is uh, honoring um, the the decolonial nature of, of, of the movement that it needs to be? That it doesn't reproduce the very structures that got us here in the first place, essentially. Well, Damn, uh, that's questionless. I have the chills right now because uh, the answer to that question is so painful for you, Liz. And here's the answer. You got to do it. Mm -hmm. Like you, women. You dig what I'm saying? Like, I, uh, men cannot dismantle patriarchy. Even though we are the main person that are, we are the perpetrators of patriarchy. And here's why we can't. Um, one of my favorite books ever, if, if, the, if you, anybody listening to this podcast gets nothing out of this podcast, read Paolo Freire, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. I will say again, read. Paolo, P-A-U-L-O, Freire, <laughs> F-R-E-I-R-E, -E, The Pedagogy of the Oppressed. I think that is that book needs to be required reading for every human on earth. So in that book, he talks about, again, the fact that oppression exists. It's an, it's an entire book about oppression in whatever form it may take. Here's the, the tough pill that sucks. Even though white people are the reason why white supremacy exists. As a result of that, they are incapable of dismantling it. Even though men are the reason that patriarchy exists, as a result of that, they are incapable of dismantling it. And here's why. Because Liz, if I start a men's movement to educate men about the ills of patriarchy and with all the great beneficial underpinnings that you're speaking towards, it would still be constructing a world based on the opinion of a man. Mm -hmm. I would never have the capability to actually have a true understanding of what liberation for a woman looks like. It is impossible for me to actually be able to, if I am still, and, and how Paolo writes it in the book, is that even the most loving, kind, uh, generous, charitable movement of freeing and liberating people from oppression, if that movement is created by the oppressor, it can never be more than false generosity. Mm. And damn. that shit, ugh, ugh. Yeah. Like, it just hurt. It's just like, damn, women got to do it. But, but okay, the, I like but, this. But, I think this is an and, an and, like yeah, you said. No, I'm, I don't yeah, think it's an and. So, no, so, so. Let me be clear. I'm yeah. not saying that. And so we, me and we just chill back and just let this yeah, shit yeah, no, I'm, I'm Again, these conversations, my my entire life is about be, bringing people to awareness of the issues and the problems that are happening. But my point is the people that are at the forefront of creating the new world that is mm -hmm. void of patriarchy must be those most affected by patriarchy because those are the people, those are the only people that will have any understanding or an inkling of how yeah. to do it. That's right. difficult. Everybody doesn't want to hold that weight, but it's true. Right. White people can't. White people can't liberate black people. Black people, even though it's white people's fault, because if they mm. did it themselves, it would still be a world created by them. Mm -hmm. I mean, I th there's so many things going through my head. Like I, it, it's funny because I'm the only person on this podcast whose presence on this podcast is questioned, <laughs> right? Like people constantly, even you've really? asked me. Yeah, because like, why would a woman? I mean, read the comments, and that's what people ask me constantly about my book. I got flagged from women for writing about men, and then I got flagged from men for writing about men, right? Why would you write about masculinity? Why would you be on a podcast about masculinity? And so I appreciate what you're saying. I think it's extremely important uh, to have 
women be centered in these conversations around masculinity because we know you best <laughs> in the same way that, uh, w you know, white people don't understand whiteness as far uh, as, 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 as black people do, because you literally become experts exactly. in whiteness to survive. Um, but then exactly. I also think like, I don't want the men's movement to be about liberating me. That makes me like kind of nauseous. Um, I, that like is not interesting to me at all. That comes back to what you were saying about your dad, who I'm sure is a lovely uh, and sounds like a lovely man. Uh, but that's not the approach, right? I don't, I'm not looking for a man to liberate me. I'm looking for a man to liberate himself so that I can live my life. As Paolo writes, his exact words were, and so the harsh truth is that the oppressor must liberate themselves and also the oppressor. Right. The, the oppressed the must liberate themselves and the oppressor because the oppressor is inherently incapable of liberating themselves. Wow, what I disagree. Oh, well, let's. Oh, what, oh, what, wait, well, hold on. So, what do you? What do you? Tell me. Talk. Well, how Let's am I? I mean, to use Jamie's language, you know, how am I supposed to liberate you when your foot is on my neck, right? Like, and and uh, I I know this is uh, in the context of race, and I'm not. Uh, no, no, no. You know, you're right. Using that to talk about gender, but 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 like, how am I supposed to liberate you when you're like oppressing me, right? Mm. Like, if I have no power. How am I supposed to have the power to liberate you when you are the one who has the power to do it for yourself? I, two things. A, I am not Paolo Freire. He's dead. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I, I cannot give you the answer for all the idiosyncrasies, but right. the reason why I do resonate with it and I do consider that outlook to be a valid one is so what I am, again, I want to be very clear. Men absolutely must amongst ourselves, communicate with ourselves of how to dismantle patriarchal structures. Mm -hmm. I am saying that the way in which we do that, let's say the curriculum by which we do that, cannot be a self-ordained curriculum. Got it. Because it would still be what we think is yes. best. Of course. Well, so well, sure, yes, we men yeah. liberate themselves, but women teach us how. Because like... Yeah, learn from again, us. We, the, yes. And but but also exactly. all of that is already out there. Like, right. Like, it's not about asking women how to do it. It's like there are books uh, that are written by women. There are like it's all available. It's on Google <laughs> and and use that knowledge. Right. So use the knowledge of of and 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 wisdom of women to liberate yourself. That's what you're saying. Absolutely. Centering the work of women, Absolutely. but not demanding Absolutely. their labor to in your freedom. Yeah, I think that. Absolutely not demanding their labor. Right. But again, so here's what I say for me. And again, this that labor is on is on any person that, who has the heart and desire to do that labor. For example, me as a black man who knows that part of my mission is to liberate black people, which thereby requires liberating white people too. A lot of black people is like, fuck y'all, go read some yeah, shit on y'all own. For sure. I don't got nothing yeah. to do with this. That's y'all shit. Yeah. I am a person that realizes that mm -hmm. as much as it sucks, as much as it is labor on me, again, every single day I'm putting out videos to liberate people, often people that are men like me or white people. You dig what I'm saying? And so it's the, the I'm not saying that it is that the labor should be demanded upon anyone, nor am I saying that anyone must take on that desire to do it. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is that for those of you that do have the um, the wherewithal to do that, I think that our journey towards freedom is best when the most oppressed uh, are at the helm of liberation. So I am I am willing to take on the labor required to teach white people through their dumb bullshit. Because sounds, even when they read this books, they gonna interpret that shit wrong. They not yeah. they gonna think it through their lens. So now yeah. I gotta fucking babysit mm -hmm. you and stand over you like yep. your fourth grade teacher and teach mm -hmm. you. And again, a lot of people don't get the patience. I'm not saying black people should have to do that. Mm. I am saying that I am willing to do that because it's necessary for people. I'm right with you on that. I do that every day of my life. Exactly what you're saying. Feel you. Um I have to to survive. Stands over me all the time. Yeah. I, I I have to. I, I because the the truth <laughs> is, I believe that men are good people. I believe that white people are good people. Um, I can't just um say fuck y'all, and then keep it moving. I know that. Oh, mm -hmm. I have something to offer. I think I can help uh shift your thinking, and I'm willing to take that on. And what's so beautiful? 
what's so beautiful about what you're saying, Jamie, and I think you'll be interested in this list. Here's my other super conspiracy theory that I talk about every now and again. That is also a hot take, but I think it's very interesting. I think that <laughs> Black men and white women are have the two highest responsibilities in liberating the world. Mm -hmm. And here's why. Because both Black men and both white women are the only two in this dichotomy that I'm speaking of that have the experience of being an oppressor and oppressed Impressed. simultaneously. Yeah. You dig what I'm saying? I am oppressed because I am Black. I am oppressor because I am a man. I am oppressed because I am woman. I am oppressor because I am white. Mm -hmm. And so that empathy that you have, Jamie, is something that is specific that a black woman ain't got. They like, nigga, everybody foot on my neck, fuck all of y'all. Yeah. And so they don't care. And, 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 and honors to all the black women that have to deal with that shit. So I don't put nothing on black women's back. But white women, because y'all y'all understand how I feel to be mm -hmm. oppressed, but also y'all see what y'all be doing on, on some oppressive shit. It's your responsibility mm -hmm. to get up out here and say, okay, you're squeaking Let's figure this out. And us mm -hmm. as black men, like, okay, let's figure this out. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Because mm -hmm. black women, they just got puts on their necks. And again, women of color in general. And then white men, they just don't know what the fuck <laughs> to do. Because the, again, when you just have all privilege and all power, it's just like, you, mm. as a white man, you just got to learn how to listen. You dig know what I'm saying? Because anything from yeah. your normal way of doing something is going to be incorrect. So let me just, let me, I'm you sorry, Liz. Can, can yeah. I just, do you, do you mind? I'm sorry. I don't no, want, uh, okay. just because I want to yeah. respond to a couple things you said. So I hear all you're saying. Yeah. I don't think anything you're saying yeah. is uh, inherently wrong. I think, but yeah. um, we have to be careful with this um, because yeah. in the process, it can then alleviate men from thinking they got work to do. Hell no. Nah. In my mind, I do not put the onus on women to change sexism, patriarchy, and all of these things. I just, I just can't. What, what y'all choose to do, um, I recognize you play a role in this for sure, in your liberation. Yeah. But what I do yeah. know is I'm standing at the front door, and no matter how much y'all are doing, all us men are standing at this front mm. door and then just firing at you and not letting you in. So the work men have to do is get the fuck out the way. Facts. We have to talk to each other. We'll be like, okay, hold on a second, guys. I don't want to create, like she had said, she doesn't want us to be a system that then determines what her liberation is. But we, if we are the, the if, if we are standing at the door and guarding it, we have to at least at some point say, or we're control of our company and we don't have women in our companies and we're not paying them. Or the systems that are at place are controlled by men. We have to raise new men and our kids, right? I don't know if you got babies, but I got boys. I tell them, this is your responsibility. Your responsibility is not to free a woman yourself or liberate a woman, I should say. Your responsibility is to see women as equal, to get out of their way, to consult with them, to invite them in your, your um, company to consult equally so that this new system in place isn't just, of course, men shouldn't create it. It should be created by all people, by men and women in consultation. Otherwise we're left. So I agree with this point. We have a huge responsibility, but that's going to come second out my mouth. The first one is get the fuck out my way. Get your, your foot Push off up. my neck. I need you to internalize what's going on. Do some work so that you can allow me. Because right now you're the, the gatekeeper. So that you can allow yeah. me to liberate myself. And so long as you are in control, yeah. it don't matter how much work I do. If I can't never get through that door. If the army is yeah. standing at the door, you can have a wonderful group of people. But if, if if they're just being shot down all the time, they're never let in. So I'm not saying you're saying this. I'm saying this just in general yeah. so that men that we can really internalize and say, let's not put this off and start, you know, conflating this whole idea and think that this is a woman issue. Um, it's absolutely no, no. Patriarchy is a man's issue. White supremacy is a white person's issue. Mm -hmm. And so I want to be very clear you're about clear. You're clear. the energy and yeah, yeah, but even I, I, even outside of being clear to you, I want to be clear to listeners. So what I'm what I'm suggesting is that yes, we are aware that white men have dominated this earth in an oppressive, terrible way, and thus they need to stop doing that shit. Mm -hmm. All I am saying is that the new world that we create, sans oppression, could not, cannot, absolutely under no circumstance be one engineered by them, even their kindness. And so the people that are at the helm of creating this new world must be the most marginalized. Yeah, so we mix. That so is what I I'm think, suggesting. Yeah, you're saying basically. Yeah, yeah. 
uh, we have work to do as men. Get out the way. Revisit yeah. yourself. All that stuff, self-reflection, um, liberate your own mind and, and all these things. But as we're constructing, yeah. don't think that you're the one to construct it now, construct it for women. Yeah, like shut up and literally let the, like, we can be the, we Great. can be the physical laborers of the construction, if you will, from this ana yes. a metaphorical, but the architects needs to be women, specifically mm. black women yeah. need to architect the new world. We can do all the building and physical labor, but the architects must be black queer Muslim women, not specifically that, yep. but I'm talking about all of the intersections of oppression, but must be the, those that are the most marginalized must be at the helm of creating. A new Amen world. to all that. Again, that cre sure. Creating from I ideating standpoint. So that's the what you mean. Work obviously needs to be done by us. But so like we are, and, and I'm not a, a Muslim black woman, obviously, but I, what I'm saying is that yeah. or they are, if, if we want to talk about the most marginalized yeah. people are creating right. and existing. Absolutely. The problem is there's, uh, they're being literally cock blocked, <laughs> if we want to use that metaphor, um, <laughs> in like the streets, in their offices, in their homes, like in government. So, so it's like, yes. I agree. I think, I, again, I think we agree, but like women are already doing this. We are For getting sure. in their way. And so to your point is, is, is liberation just men sitting back? White it men is sitting men, back? it is white men sitting back and open heartedly listening and thereby uh, moving on the instructions as, as, and I only like language like instructions on the ideations of the most marginalized. It is people willing to say, okay, let me shut the fuck up, listen to what needs to be done and thereby do that work. Mm. And, and not create my own rubric or curriculum of what I think liberation is because that is right. impossible to be an accurate cur curriculum. But how do, how do we get there, right? So, because that's what I, I kind of heard you, like that's kind of what you meant when you said it's on, it's on you, that it's not yeah. technically on women. The, but the work has to then be us men, white men. Absolutely. Hello, as the white man well, all, here. All men. But like men, uh, um, yeah. it, doing the work that even makes this idea of shutting up even possible or listening even possible because we're told we're, yeah. That's not what makes a man, right? So That's, there's like there's there's almost like work before the work before the work before we can even allow mm -hmm. and allow is the patriarchal term I'm using mm -hmm. the women who are already fighting for this to get in because it's the club analogy mm -hmm. that you used. It's like here we are. Why would I relinquish my power? Why would I do that? Like no, no, you're wrong. Right? The benevolent sexism that exists in your father that exists in all of yeah. us really to the certain because we're just we're socialized. So it's like. What's the what's that like mass dehypnotizer mm -hmm. that exists in the world mm -hmm. that like you know we can put up on the top of like the Empire State Building and <laughs> and the Sears Tower and all these places that then suddenly all the men will wake up and go like oh this isn't working for anybody mm -hmm. and let's use like a practical example mm -hmm. right because all I, I love that question and this is a very an interesting conversation but it's theoretical like when it comes to let's say reproductive rights what should white men or men be doing? How can we use that as an example of, based on this pedagogy? That's a great question. This, this example that you're talking about in terms of when we approach uh, this kind of work. <laughs> it, I, ironically, at first I was, I didn't know what I thought about that, but now I know exactly what I think mm -hmm. about that. <laughs> I have a video where I talk about abortion. You do, yeah. It's just like, the whole room of people deciding on what's going to happen with women is white men. Yeah. That's the problem. It's men making the decision for what they deem as correct for women. And that is the problem. How about the room of, re of reproductive rights be filled with women? The, but, but again, that's imaginative. What's happening now is that mm -hmm. there is a room full of white men. So what can we do in mm -hmm. this moment? That's tough. You dig know what I'm saying? And then that's where my far left leaning brothers and sisters and thems and theys would suggest just tear this bitch down. Just tear this whole shit down. You dig know what I'm saying? And again, yeah. I'm not saying that that I am advocating complete revolution, but what I am saying is that that is a very difficult wall to climb to try to figure out how to make accurate reproductive rights when the entire room is white men. Mm -hmm. I don't even know how the fuck to solve that. You dig know what I'm saying? I, 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 I'll I be honest with you, other than 
creative. But but the 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 first level, the only tangible thing I can say is that it starts with grassroots, right? Because it's just right. like the Civil Rights Act, right, was was not because Lyndon B. Johnson just wanted to give niggas the right to vote. It's because a million people say, give it to us now. You dig what I'm saying? So whatever that grassroots movement looks like, it needs to be that. It needs to be demanded of the people. But until you dig what but I'm this saying? is the, but this is that like back to that like mass hypnosis thing. Until all yeah. of us men who hold the power mm -hmm. wake up, right? We yeah. won't relinquish it. So the but only here, way here's, here's to that point that uh, I want to interrupt you because I, I get where you're at. There, there's a um, there's a quote a quote by Cornell West, and it says the condition of truth is to allow suffering to speak. And so the reason why Lyndon B. Johnson could finally give, and again, back to these these stupid terms, give civil rights hmm. to the people is um, a result of the suffering being clear, right? The 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 the, the tactic of the civil rights activists, which, which I mean, the, the 60s civil rights movement, which again, isn't the current tactic, but what's the tactic then? They're like, hey, we're going to go to these public places and we're going to do nothing. And we're going to literally let them hose us down and throw dogs on us and spit on us specifically for the attention that's going to come as a result of that. So it can be shine, it can shine in people's faces how fucked up this is. That was the point. Like the the, the they, they intentionally had sit-ins where they intended upon going there and being tortured just for that to be seen. Mm -hmm. You dig mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And again, yeah. we as their grandchildren ain't fuck with that. Ain't nobody spitting on my face. We we have. Uh, there's a there's a quote that goes around now. This ain't your mama's civil rights movement. You dig right. what I'm saying? We not on that. However, the what I'm speaking to is that suffering, um, when the people, when the people display and put on front street the obvious discrepancies in a system, there then becomes more of a call to heal the system, which is the point in its core of grassroots movements yeah. is to showcase and to create a platform in which it is seen and clear and obvious. This is why, at least at people's hearts, uh, they share the videos, which I am not necessarily for, the sharing of videos of people getting murdered. It's the, 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 the desire, what people want to do is say, this is horrible. That's why people shared the pictures of the men on horses with the Haitians at the border, right? They want to, what the, what the idea is to say, look at this horrible thing, fix it. That is the idea. Again, there's a whole now with social media, there's this concept of trauma porn and a lot of things that I don't really agree with. What I am suggesting is that our first steps, and again, this is one man's opinion, our first steps in any like active liberation movement is, is demand. It is demand from the grassroots up and showcasing that it is a problem. Because like you said, the way that privilege exists is that you could be blind to it. And so many people just exist in their normal way of living life. They think the, the what they're doing for abortion is the right thing to do. You dig what I'm saying? They think that, oh, we're killing babies. They don't, they don't, they, they don't, they're not conceptualizing it like all of the things that we understand it to be. And so we must advocate, and that's what conversations like this are so, for, to create wider awareness of the issue. So I just have a question that no, there's no answer to this, right? But I'm curious, I want to yeah, ask there's you. There's no answer to any of this, but so, just honestly. So, like, so can, just knowing that, is, right? Is so knowing, knowing in some ways the burden is on the oppressed here, um, and, and that like they have to see the suffering. What the, 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 the oppressors have to see the suffering. What do we make? What do we make of our current landscape, where, with misinformation and with these algorithms that only show people what validate their current beliefs? How do you actually get people to see the suffering? Right. I, I'll give you a. The worst example is when I did my TED talk four four years ago now. Wow. Um, yeah. I it was it was like, it was like um, first grade. It was kindergarten. It was preschool. Yeah. Right. But yeah. um, but what ended up happening was this massive divide, and I saw it, where suddenly it was a left versus right thing, and it was men, that was a betrayal to men, and all these men were sharing it, it was getting picked up, 
by men and people whose whose beliefs were validated that I was anti-male. And so no men actually watched it. So they didn't even have a chance to understand mm. what I was trying to say. And I'm only using this as my personal example of what I experienced. The men that watched it privately messaged me and said, whoa, you changed my perspective. They got into some feminism. They started thinking about stuff, blah, 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 blah. And then of course, the predominant um, women who were very happy that a man was saying these things were sharing it and saying, hey, men, listen to this. So the only men that got to it were, the, were because of the women who were sharing it. And, mm. and so now you have a divide because of algorithms and misinformation. And it's, we're just, you can be screaming and shouting all day long, but all, all it takes is, is someone that has a different set of beliefs and an algorithm that pushes those beliefs to another uh, part of the internet where then the thing, the suffering is being then uh, misinterpreted as look what, look what they're trying to say and make you feel guilty for. And then nobody's getting anywhere. You have this massive, the, the, it's almost like the divide is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So what I don't understand is how how um, women, if you will, are ever going to get into that room to make the decision about their bodies when the men who are making the decision are not even paying attention to what these other people are saying because by the time it gets to them, it's polluted by misinformation and bias. So, so that's just my question of like what your – what your architect, if you're the architect of the matrix, I'm just curious, mm. like, what's the solution to that? Good luck. Uh, doo, 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 doo. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the interesting thing about this conversation, that's beautiful. And I love, and I understand like the positioning of this conversation. This is you all's podcast. I am a guest on your podcast. And so questions are being directed towards your guest. I do understand that. And also my favorite words, I don't know how to fix the fucking world. <laughs> like, I just don't, like, it's just too difficult. It's just so difficult, right? I like, just, I don't. If know. anybody could, Charity, but, I just believe. <laughs> uh, and, and so, what I'm saying is that I'm bound to say a bunch of things in this podcast that aren't the perfect thing to be said and aren't the exact methodology as to how we should proceed. You know what I'm saying? And so, like, even like what you said earlier, like, I don't think that the burden. Of, of, of fixing the world is on the oppressed. Like, I don't even like that language. Like, no, the burden is on everyone. This is, the, yeah. the burden mm -hmm. is, is, is mm -hmm. this is a world problem. It's not like, okay, so oppressed people, we fucked it up and now all oppressed people try to get your, get out of it. Like that's sadistic and evil. Like, no, I'm yeah. not saying that the burden of fixing the world is one of the most oppressed. And I didn't, I didn't mean that, to put those words in your mouth at all, by the way. I, that I, wasn't I, my I'm, and again, I, yeah. I'm not taking offense towards anything. Like, I'm just, just wanted to expand on everything. And so I'm suggesting that like, no, not the burden, but the ideation of it, the creation of it, the a truly liberated place must be created by those who are most liberated. And and even, and, and, and I'm gonna answer your question about what we should do as far as getting in those rooms, but I, I wanna follow this tangent. Another thing in, in Paolo's book, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, which is a very interesting concept. Uh, before I even talk about that, I'll talk about my friend, Benjamin. My friend, Benjamin is a very deep person. And he had this, he said a quote to me. Uh, he has a much, a, a, a less optimistic view of the world than I do. And so he said something to me that like blew my mind. He said that this world will continuously be a dystopia as long as power is the prevailing currency. And like that shit just hurt me so much when he said oh, that yeah. because I don't want to believe this world to be a dystopia. But what he was suggesting, he was talking about what often happens in liberation movements historically throughout the world is that those who were the people whose in initial intention was to liberate then in turn became oppressors. That's what's happened historically through this dance of power and power and power. You dominate me and I take over you mm -hmm. because you dominated me. And then it, it becomes this thing that stacks on top of each other. Historically, that is how the world has, has functioned. And so like, um, and so in the book, uh, Paolo said that within an oppressive society, even the concept of freedom is still within the guise of oppression. So what you understand freedom to be is an actual liberation, but to be like the oppressor. Mm. You dig what I'm saying? It's just like, oh, I ain't got no money. I don't want nothing. So now I want the money. Now I want the power. Now I don't want the thing. And so if we want liberation, we must be able to think beyond the concept of power. 
beyond the concept of of domination and power and hierarchical structure. And, and to answer that question, how do you do that? How do you see beyond a world that is so stricken with this? I don't know. Mm-hmm. Again, my first my first attempt as an artist and uh, Nina Simone, an artist's responsibility is to reflect the times. It's just like to speak. Words change things. All I can give is my heart. All I can mm-hmm. give is my words. And maybe with more words and more conversations like this being held on a bigger scale and a mass scale, again, more mm-hmm. awareness, right? The key to enlightenment is awareness of the darkness. And as you said, so many men, so many white people are even unaware of this. Or if they are aware of it, they are aware of it within the lens of them as, as a, this person in privilege that feels like this is just how it is. Or as a you good know, person, again, that's to, not one of the people oppressing. Yeah. But so, as the least oppressed per- right. person in, the, on, in this room... What do you think white men should do yeah, good about question. let's use abortion rights yeah. for women? I mean, again, I part of what I've come to understand for myself is if I have a voice, I have to use it, mm-hmm. right? So even this, like us talking about this, right? This is my version of, hey, I'm learning in real time. Come learn with me. Um, I don't, the, the abortion thing is so hard for me to even comprehend because, because I don't understand how we can make that choice. And so so I go back to like, I don't even know how, I don't even know how that's even possible today. Right? To restrict to, women's I, yeah. right to abortion. And, and it just goes back to, I think about it in the way that he, he his, his friends do, which is, it seems like it just needs to be burned down because it's not, mm-hmm. doesn't make any sense. Mm-hmm. Like I- It's not gonna be though. I've never. It's not gonna be burned down. And and it's not. So so the only thing that I can do, right, that I can think of right now is to use my voice, which is Mm -hmm. what I attempt to do. And sometimes And and Justin, it's such a complex issue, again, which is why, again, the further, often, oftentimes, the further people get into, you know, liberation and and oppressed, uh, you know, the, the academia and the studies of this, Oftentimes they get more and more and more radicalized because it's just like, oh, yeah, we just got to burn this motherfucker down. You think I'm saying? Because again, and I don't know. I don't suggest that I'm a very nonviolent person. I'm, I, I believe in empathy. I believe that the answer to all of our problems lies in empathy. But the the, the issue is how do you get people to become empathetic, right? How do yeah. we get how do we get people to even understand that it is a requirement to have women in these rooms? These seems like duh, right? But apparently it's not duh. Apparently it's well, not yeah, obvious. It's duh to women. <laughs> yeah, it's duh to women. So, it's duh to women. Any woman who sees, you know, in your video, women, you, sure. you have this amazing infographic. It's all these white dudes. Like that's what I see all the time. But, even as, a, I see... but as a white man, if I go over there to talk to these white men and say, hey, white men, fellow white men, hey, we'll have a white person meeting, right? Mm-hmm. I Somehow I made it into the room and I'm the... <laughs> I'm the fellow white man in the room of the other white men who are making the decisions on on mm-hmm. women's bodies. And I say to these men, we should allow women in this room. W- what ends up happening, right? What ends up happening historically is I am then treated as a woman or an other and kicked out of the room mm. so they can maintain their power, which is the- which well, is, That's why like really there's more point. of you who do it, then they can't kick you out, which is exactly, the majority. That's, and that's why we wrote the yeah, book. But the that's majority of men don't speak about these I'm things. They don't, get they in don't there. get in, baby. Dying to get in. Number one is I think we end up focusing on the wrong people, which is e- each other. So, for instance, when it comes to racism, this is one of my best friends in the world, yeah. Justin here. Um, yeah. Your stance in the world has shifted. Maybe not your belief, but how you walk in that stance. But I don't expect you to change racism. It ain't going to happen. But your son has a better chance. What I hope to do is that you shift mm. enough that you then... Um, um, share your new learnings and what you care about to your child so that then he gives it to his child because what's going to happen now when we focus on one another, which we need to do, but for the most part, men, 30 years old, older, we don't shift that much. People That's don't shift true. that much. Mm. Well, let me you finish so my point. You have so much more power than a four-year-old. That's, I, but look at historically. <laughs> on him. Well, I'm just going by what I've seen and what I believe. I believe that most of the time we we, sh- we we have ideas, we shift, but our lives are already where they are. We live where we are. We are married now. We've got kids and our comfort zone is what it is. And we don't really change until we're forced to. So otherwise, if that were the case, all this talk, all this talk government would look different. Schools would look different. Communities would look different if it was just about shifting Justin. 
and shifting my other friend over here and shifting my other friend over here. So ultimately, yes, we have to he keep having these conversations, but I think where the real change happens, and it's a long, slow burn, I always talk to you about, Justin, about what we all wanna do is we wanna take a sledgehammer and knock down this wall right away, and it ain't gonna happen like that. That's true, I, I'm always yeah. He's always like, let me get the sledgehammer and do some big grand gesture. And because bring I the see wall down. people suffering, and, and I and, wanna help. And it's not gonna happen, otherwise racism yeah. would have been done a long time ago, if that were the problem. Patriarchy would have been done a long time ago. This is a slow fucking thing that we got to take our hammer and chisel and then chisel away at it every day with diligence all the time. So that means we got to be in it for the long haul. It's not going to look different for your life, Liz, in 10 years. Otherwise, 10 years ago, it would it would have been different for the other person. And in 30 years, it has it's changed. It has, it's it has different changed. from five years ago. I don't think we should tell people that because then it makes people feel like they're hopeless and they can't be part of change. That's when not what I'm saying. It is. That's not what I'm saying. I, I hear that. I'm not saying to be hopeless. We have to do the work. Sure. We have to do the work every day. But I've but if seen we, a change. I've seen a change in my lifetime. And, I'm and seeing, I have seen a change in my life too. Yeah. That's not, but the change, there's still someone on my neck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's I'm not still experiencing over. black people are dying every single day. Yeah. Racism is still there. So while it's changed, the shit is still happening. Sure. While it's changed for you, it's better. Both it's still true. fucked up. Yeah, yeah. So what I, all I'm saying is that yeah. this wall ain't going to come down tomorrow. The way that it really comes down is we have to keep having the conversations, keep shifting and shifting. But most of our focus ultimately has to be on our next generations. I'll tell you a quick story. I was in mm -hmm. Africa. I'm in this village. All the surrounding villages, they're all struggling with their crops, with their education, with what's going on. They've all been struggling for a long time. One particular village decided, let's take all our resources and send all our children to school. Ten years later, their crops start growing more than anybody else's did simply because they focus their energy on the next generation. Because the other ones, while they were learning and consulting and talking, they're stuck in their ways and they do their thing. But the next generation who is empowered and given the opportunity to bring new thought and new learning comes back to it and then things start to change. So I'm not saying we don't do the work. Of course, Liz, we have to and have this, the, 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 the burn, that, that is slow burn change in real time right now. But ultimately, if our focus becomes about our education system with children, if your children, Maxwell, you are saying this matters to me, I know I'm going to do my work, but I'm going to put him in um, classes where he learns about equality of men and women. He's going to be dealing with racism uh, and, and, and having real conversations about it that I can't offer. I don't have the stuff, but I'm going to have him talk to my buddy over here. I'm going to have him talk to Liz over here so that now Maxwell at 15 years old, when he's in his school, he's championing things that you never did. Mm -hmm. And your father never did. So then now this system that's actually the white men that we're talking about, the government that is making these rules and laws for women now in 20 years. And I don't want to wait that long, but at least we would know the group of people that are there are a different breed of people raised with different concepts. So we can't wait that long. But I think when we ask that question, how do we change it? Ultimately, I think it changes with our next generations with what we do now. I want to I want to say uh I think that's a beautiful point. Again, like I told you, my long-term goal is to create a school. That is my long-term goal. And to after create a school, hopefully work in shifting the entire educational system, because I think that the way in which we rear humans is is the the, the our biggest bet in creating a new world is to rear humans differently, to teach people empathy from childhood, because we don't teach people empathy. We teach people this capitalistic, rugged, individualist, concept which creates and leads to further domination yeah. and so i do understand that concept and i do completely resonate with that jamie to your point uh justin and to kind of the uh, greater energy i think of what liz was speaking about even with the abortion concept and all of the white men in the room what can we do now one of the first things that we need to do and again this is this this is just the subtle way in which white supremacy and patriarchy and capitalism all of these things are just ever entwined with one another we have to undo this concept of meritocracy, because if you were to say, Justin, I mean, if you were to if Justin was to walk in the room and say, Governor, whoever the fuck, why isn't there enough women in this room? They would say, well, the women weren't elected. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. They would they would give you some description to suggest that they earned their place in this room and that and and so this room looks like this because we just so happen to be the most qualified people. And we don't understand how, which is the necessity for things like affirmative action. This is the necessity for an awareness that we don't exist in a meritocracy. We exist in a world where people are going to hire the white man before they hire anybody, just off default perception that white is better, that has been, that has been 
propagated into every human in the American system. You dig what I'm saying? And so we imagine that these rooms are, or not we, but the people that are in those rooms imagine that those rooms are the way they are because they earned it. It's the way it was supposed to be. We need to dismantle the concept that people out here just earning these high standpoints like you know mm. what i'm saying like and that's another uh, people a mm. lot of people's critique on capitalism as well mm. like the idea that many of these people in these high levels of power use language like i earned it when it's mm-hmm. much more nuanced than that yeah mm. so, yeah 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 appreciate it um i know we need to start wrapping we up we do need we? to wrap up this is amazing thank you so much for taking this into a whole different direction um <laughs> we really always always appreciate it so, trying to solve the world's problems on the man up yes podcast. it will and what i preach about it is also <laughs> is that i think we're a lot of we're saying a lot of the same things yeah there might be some things yeah. that we have a little bit different view on but yeah. the point is we're talking about it yeah um, and it's the yes and he said the like yes earlier really it's good. yes yeah. And. and yes, and we need to go into rapid fire. You got a flight to go to. You do got a flight to go um, to. I do so, have a flight. <laughs> Charity, what are you afraid of? So, uh, I, what am I afraid of? Uh, I, I the concept of being afraid for sure. Like that's not just being poetic, mm. like dead ass. Mm, mm, love, love that. that. Yeah, love I just that. don't. I don't fuck with fear. I'm trying to dismantle it in all ways. Oh. Mm. What brings you the most joy? Uh, passion, uh, making things beautiful, like whether that's words, whether it's the the same reason that I want society to be be better and to take away oppression is the same way reason I rap. And it's the same reason I play piano. And it's the same reason I like nice clothes because I like beautiful things. And I wish that the world was more beautiful. What are you most insecure about? Hmm. Most insecure about people misunderstanding my intent. Like loving somebody real hard and then maybe I didn't answer the phone for my mama and then she she takes that as like because I don't care about her or something like that. Like people not understanding the 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 full heartedness of my intent, even in my mistakes. Mm-hmm. You said yeah. that you haven't cried in a while. Patriarchy. Uh, yeah. When was the last time you cried? <laughs> as rapid fire as I can, it was actually, um, I had a girlfriend who I had yelled at and I had never yelled at her before. And I really yelled at her. And then I realized that the reason why I was yelling at her is because she reminded me of something that my dad did. And then I deeply apologized to her. She understood it. And I went and had a big, huge conversation like with so much passion and even fury at my father, as far as all of the problems that happened with us growing up and we had that reckoning and I had never seen my dad cry. He broke into tears and said, I didn't know, I didn't know, I didn't know. And we're just weeping, like boo-hooing. It was a crazy situation. That was like two years ago. That was very recent. Mm, Yeah, it was like wild. It was like the reckoning with all the patriarchal fuck shit that happened with my daddy raising me. We had a reckoning like two years ago. Yeah. My dad and I had a conversation on this podcast that was really powerful. It's beautiful. Yeah. All right. Hey, man, we're going to give you a time machine. All right. You're in Back to the Future. Mm-hmm. The movie. <laughs> you got this time machine. You get to go back to when you were seven, eight, nine years old. Um, mm. you, can whisp- you can whisper something to yourself. What would that be? When YouTube out, when YouTube come out, nigga, don't stop posting. I would have, if I could go back to like 2013 when like social media first started, I would, I would have went way, 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 way harder. I would have went way, way harder. And I often regret I did not go hard enough when social media first started. Before been... Justin asked you this, this next question, I just have a one question for you. Tell me. Yes. Uh, um, real quick. You don't have to explain it because you are, mm-hmm. uh, you're super confident and you, and you um, talk with such, um, um, charisma, you know, and your your stance is really strong. And I don't mean your stance and your opinions, but just how you stand in them. Um, tell me a weakness of yours. When I get anxious, it can get really bad. Sometimes I let fear creep in in a way that is like I I, I have quite hypochondriac tendencies. I can't number to you how many times I have driven to the hospital thinking that I was about to die. I can't even give you a number of how many times I've done that. Mm. 
Mm. And it's I hate it every time it happens. But like if if like my if my stomach or chest start feeling weird, I'm I'm thinking I'm dying. <laughs> you know, it's it sucks actually. It sucks. So then so so then your greatest fear is you're afraid of death. No, uh, uh, and it's interesting. I have a I have a chapter in my book that's called "What Is Death," where I literally method wrote the entire chapter. What I mean by that is like I only wrote that chapter while I was having anxiety attacks. So every time I had an anxiety attack, I would go and write this chapter while I was having an anxiety attack because they were so common. And mm-hmm. um, what I came what I came to understand through the writing of that chapter, and I think that isn't just understanding for me, but might be something for everyone, is that I don't think anybody is really actually afraid of death. We're afraid of suffering. You're not afraid about dying. You're afraid about what might happen after you die or who you may leave behind or will it hurt or we're afraid of suffering. And yes, I am afraid of suffering. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, time machine, fast forward. You're a guest at your own funeral. What do you hope is said about you? <sighs> Jesus. That's a that's that's a question right there. Y'all got some questions. I hope that people uh, I hope that people say that he might he made Earth better and he showed people that a limitless existence was possible and he helped make the world a little bit more free, a little bit more limitless, a little bit more inspired. Mm. Yeah. Love that. Um, we have an audience question from SC Veronica. When did you last challenge traditional masculinity? Today with my manager, Justin. <laughs> Love to hear yes. it. Um, <laughs> and our last question, we ask every guest, what does it mean for you to be man enough? Um, to delete that language from humanity. Yeah, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a show, and I'll say this last thing, I know y'all gotta go. There was a movie called um, The Mask You Live In. I'm sure all of y'all yeah. have seen that. Mm-hmm. And uh, the very first question in that movie was, uh, when was the first time you were told to be a man? And ugh, that shit hurt me so hard because I remember it. It was the day I turned 10. And my dad said, you in double digits now, son. It's time to be a man. Mm. Mm. And that shit. And ever since I was like, before 10, my daddy would like, hey, he used to call me his big eye man. He used to baby me and was all cute mm. and sweet. But then when I turned 10, Suddenly, I needed to be responsible. I needed, he started being hard on me, and like, that shit was whack. We need to delete mm. the whole concept of being a man, being man enough, at least, because everyone's man enough. Mm. Well, with that, Charity, you're right. And you, my friend, are man enough. And thank you for being here. I love you. I love all of you. I really appreciate that. I know we all appreciate this conversation. This is amazing. Man. Thank we you for making time. We gotta continue it maybe in person, all right? Yeah. Absolutely. I appreciate y'all so much with all my heart. Thank and you're doing you. such beautiful yeah. work. Keep going. Keep going. Keep educating. Keep liberating. Love it, man. Um, and uh, we'll see you soon. Man. Thank you. All right, we'll be right, right back. Be safe, be safe, be safe. is Man Enough. Hello, and welcome back to Man Enough. Uh, that was that was a very interesting conversation. Yes, yes. A very energizing, stimulating conversation. It was. Where we went into more detail about a lot of the things we've been talking about all this time. What mm. did you think? I feel bad I asked him to fix the world a little bit. I feel like I put him on. You didn't do that. I mean. What are you feeling about? See, you got to get rid of that whole thing about like you, you asked a question. Don't feel bad. There's no reason for you to feel bad about that. I mean, we got enough things in the world to feel bad about. That's not one. Please don't carry that. Um, you asked him a question, and it, that facilitated a conversation, right? Yeah. That um, helped. So that was good. Liz, you asked what we thought. Um, I am interested. He started sharing all this about, um, I forget what question you asked, but he essentially said the answer is tough. It's on you. Mm-hmm. Uh, the liberation of women or the freedom of women or the patriarchy or, you know, I forget what the question was. but um, And then that sparked a long conversation. Yeah. yeah. Um, how, what do you feel about that? What well, you- I mean, I, I think a lot about, and this is something else that I learned from Rachel Ricketts, um, this amazing, uh, activist and author, everyone should go follow and support, uh, that as a white woman, I am both, uh, oppressed and the oppressor. And I, and I thought that was a really interesting point to sort of link, 
uh, white women and, and black men, which I, I've never, I don't know, we don't usually link, or I've never seen anyone sort of link uh, their experience and therefore their positioning, I guess, mm -hmm. in how to do this kind of work. So I thought that was really, really interesting. And I think, yeah, I think saying it's on you, I think is a, a tough in, in, in the way that he is so amazing in, in, in the way that he reframes things and talks about things differently. That's why he's so successful and, and I think important. I, I understand what he means after we had the conversation, but I think right. in the moment I was like, wait, what? But 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 we agree, right? That women are and and queer women and black women are are already doing their thing and they yeah. have, you know, are doing incredible things. And the problem is uh we are getting in their way. And so it is on them, but they are also already doing so it's kind of not on them. Yeah, I love <laughs> when he way. when he summed it up with I I'm just gonna leave it with this all that he had said. Um, it is up to men indeed to help tear this shit down. But don't think that it's up to you to rebuild it. The architects yes. should be this person and this person, women and queer people and black women. And uh, they should be part of the architectural structure of you know re rebuilding it. Um, or going back to how it was built, which is how indigenous, right? It, it's it's also sure. not a rebuilding. It's it, and we didn't talk about that, but it's a yeah, like indigenous queer. Alok uh, spoke to this beautifully. How queer people have been existing forever, yeah. uh, and they've been creating and 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 you know structuring our society. We we we've just you know pillaged them and tried to <laughs> we've tried to erase yes. them. And can I ask one more question? Um, and and because we've had this, I think this is an important one. We've had this conversation about benevolent sexism. You asked him what his definition of it was. And it was interesting because I'm trying to reconcile this mm -hmm. um, in, in a mode of like learning. Um, because we've had this and you've said some things that I do is kind of like, a, you know, you haven't called me a benevolent sexist, but maybe some of the things I've said. And I'm trying to wrap my head around that. What he described seemed different than what's in my head. He described his father as being a benevolent sexist. He would do all these wonderful things for women. He would compliment them and do this and this because he saw them as less than, or he saw them as subservient and saw them as someone that was needed. So therefore his kind acts were sexist, even though they were benevolent. And what I, and I don't know if that's a difference than if you do see the person as equal. If I say Liz is incredible, she's the most incredible person I've ever known, forget men or women, and my mom is, and this person is this person. Therefore, my experience is women are better, or women are just better at this. Is that the same thing? Because yeah. I'm not, I'm not saying, I'm not saying those compliments or whatever because I think they're less than and they need a handout. I'm saying it because I believe it to be true. Right, but but it's the same thing. Putting someone down is the same thing as put, uh, p saying someone is subservient or someone is on a pedestal is the same thing. You're, they're still not equal to you. So, and 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 I think that the way he spoke about his father. Um, is uh, if you asked his father, he probably wouldn't say, I think women are subservient. This is why I'm doing this. He probably would have said the same thing that you say, which is well, women are so amazing. We need to protect them. Women are so amazing, right? Like Donald Trump, like I worship women. Uh, no, no, sorry. I cherish women was what he would say all the time. But it still feels like lumping. It still feels like different things. Because well, what he, his power. Yeah, it's, it's still not equality because we're the same. There's, there's actually no difference. And so even if it's a positive difference or a negative difference, um, it's still assuming a difference. And, you know, in the way that we do that with race, right? Well, black people are just amazing athlete that black people are just better that's actually uh that is racism right because race is not real race was invented by a bunch of white people who colonized this place sure if they say that if someone says to me oh you're better black because you're a better athlete so you're this or that, that that's racist if a white person ever said in my experience i've been across the world and black people as a whole Man, they have compassion like no other. They're better with yeah, compassion. Because of white supremacy, they've been or forced they to- Or they are more loving to one another. Or they're this, or they're this. If it's due to their culture, I don't feel, that does not feel racist to me. But that you, feels through observation. And it's not saying it's different than those examples you used. And his response, even though, like you had just said, his father would say one thing out loud, but his interpretation of was, even though my father may have said that, he was on the side saying this, oh, women need help. He was raising my daughter to be covered. He was raising this. So his uh, actions actually spoke different than what his those things were. I'm just trying to understand if men, if there are people that, that say out loud the value that they see in women, and maybe the word better is too much. Well, it's like, what what is the difference between people saying, because you're black, uh, black people are better athletes, and you saying women are just better because 
you're more compassionate. What What is the difference between I those two I didn't say things? compassionate. I said- or, or whatever the reason is. Because in both cases, isn't that the same? I, I, I don't think so. Not if someone, if someone says black people are better athletes, so they're better. Women are better at compassion. They're better. Yes, I think that's the same. And you just said it was racist. So why is it not sexist to also say that? Because I have not said that. I don't think that there are women people, are better. Not because they're compassionate. If someone says, if a white person ever says to a black person, I think black people, in my experience, are one of the better groups of people in the world, I do not think that's racist. If they're, for whatever the reason is, if I think I'm saying to a woman, and, and I'm, I'll, I'll let go of this stance, but if I'm saying in my experience, not because of one thing, because of their intellect, their compassion, their their heart, because of how they manage this, because of how they manage this, because they're multitaskers and all of this, because of this, all of the stuff that I have seen, all of the things, not because of one thing. I think women, when I take a sample pool of 100 women versus a sample pool of 100 men, I think the women in general are the ones that I would want to run a company. I would want to raise children. I would want to be the bearers of my product I, of everything. The ones that I would trust are more the women in there. Therefore, my experience, that, that's, that, I don't but know. But it's the same. It's the same as saying, it's the same. I, I think what I'm, it's, because it's, you're saying I, I, it's one interesting. Is better it, than the it's other. interesting to hear this conversation. Okay. Because I've heard you say this a thousand times, yeah, and I've heard you say this before, and, and what, I'm asking, what honestly, I'm seeing, what I'm, I'm trying seeing, to understand, okay. it, what, what, I'm, what I'm seeing, is this idea of the benevolent sexism piece. When I'm hearing you both talk, I think the root of it has to be why, like why are women quote unquote better, right? Why are um, why are we putting them on if we are on this pedestal? And if we go to the root of it, right, the why, 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 it probably comes down to patriarchy. It's probably because of the suffering, because of the oppression that they've had to develop these things. Because if we are the same, if we if there is equality and we are born the same as this, I mean, we know that already that men are just as sensitive as women. We just numb it. Right, we have just as much empathy at birth, but we are taught to numb it. So, if 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 the reason we think women are quote unquote better is because of these qualities, they only have those qualities because of the oppression. So, I wonder if that is what takes ties it back to it's just so confusing. It's what's confusing for me, and I can't wrap my head around yet, and I want to, is we oftentimes on this podcast, I oftentimes hear women will say women um, are better at um, communicating at therapy, at getting together and we talk our feelings out. Men don't. Any group of people that talks their feelings out in my path, I don't care if it's men, women, children, adults, old people, anyone that talks is going to be a better uh, breed of people than people who don't. But they, but haven't they had to for their safety? For sure. And like for, for sure. But I'm just looking at the product now yeah. and I'm saying, I'm being told by women, we, men don't talk as much. Yeah. Men hold stuff. Women do. To me, if I have two children, two men, two boys, one boy that talks a lot and yeah. works out stuff and another man did, this boy is going to be, uh, I think, grow up to be a better human. Yeah. Can I use a real life example in this podcast? Why am I the only one who counts the minutes and who manages the time? What would be your answer? Probably that I'm better at it or that you're just not good at paying attention in that way? Because no. I end up having to do that labor. You because know that, you, because right? Because you've... <laughs> because you've been put in that position. You right. had to right. probably for a long, a lot longer as a woman, you've had to pay attention to all of these things. But what I've been told and what many women are told is, oh, you're just really good at that. And that's what happens in corporate America constantly where women are put in charge of scheduling. We're put in charge of managing time. And this happens obviously in the home as well, as we know, but like you look how we just fall into those roles. Yeah. And I think that that is rooted again in this idea that I'm just better at it, but I'm not. You were forced to be. <laughs> you better. could also manage the time, but you don't. And so I, that's where benevolent sexism comes in, and that's where the that consequences point of that pedestal, right? That, that point makes complete sense, to right? Me. Like me being on this, I, I, I'm just better. It doesn't actually help me, and actually kind of helps you because you don't have to do that. I just feel that we're conflating two things because I hear that point, and I think that your point is actually most important, more important than mine. I do think there it's conflated because as I said, if you have two group of people, two boys, my sons, and one talks and the other one doesn't, I'm going to be, this one's going to be a better human. 
Um, because it's a, th- because that's what creates. Uh, so all of these things that we keep pointing out that men need to get better at. If since we're not socialized at the the, the yeah. two products that I have, this one was deprived is is depriving themselves of this. Mm. This one is not as much. Therefore, this group of people currently right now because of socialization, because of all the situations, this is the one that I feel most safe with. That I think are better equipped to run the world to raise our next generation because this group of people has, has not, doesn't have it yet. We, so I, I don't know where that disconnect is because we keep talking about the fact that men need to work on stuff. We need to be better at stuff. And if we're not, that inherently says that we're not, that we need to work so that we're better at something. Doesn't that say that? Yes, but well, two things. One is because I also get that Liz brought up the time thing for a reason. Uh, we're going to end this conversation we're running out very of time. soon. <laughs> Uh, but secondly, even though we, uh, these are, this is why we're doing the podcast. This is why we're here to ask these questions. And you know what? If you're listening to this, why don't you send us your answers? Yes. Why don't you, Mm. um, comment, uh, send us a DM Mm. at we are man enough on, um, on Instagram. And we'd love to hear you enter the debate between Jamie and Liz um, <laughs> about benevolent sexism and are women better and or why. Maybe we don't have the answers, but maybe one of our amazing listeners do. Yeah. And with that note, if you enjoy the podcast, you can like and subscribe and follow us wherever you get your podcasts and or go to manenough.com slash podcast. And uh, we'll see you next time. And we can't wait to see and hear your answers. And also feel free to send us videos yeah. or audio. And we'll uh, maybe we'll even put you in mm-hmm. one of these episodes. Yeah. Make videos. Mm-hmm. We love videos. We love do. it. Love it. Love it. All right. And uh, we'll continue talking. Uh, we'll see you next time. I'm Justin Baldoni. I'm Liz Plank. I'm Jamie Heath. And this is Man Enough.